ശ്രീ എച്ച് എം എൻ സ്റ്റഡി ആൻഡ് റിസർച്ച് സെന്റർ ഇസ് ചെയർമാൻ ഓഫ് ചെയർമാൻ ഓഫ് ദിസ് സെഷൻ ആൻഡ് ഹി വിൽ ഐ റിക്വസ്റ്റ് ഹിം ടു ചെയർ ദി സെഷൻ thank you i cannot hear you can't hear you not audible now audible ah uh. am i audible now yes yeah, yeah. yes yeah. okay so good morning and welcome everybody uh, for this pendraj memorial yeah was the uh, pendraj was uh, a great missionary and friend and once chairman of uh, our board uh, he did lasting on the development sector and uh, perspective in kerala as well as india and as a student i remember being in his class for a few not not very in classes during the 80s when uh, ajay gandhi was introducing the starting to uh, privatize the economy on a large scale and he taught us taught us and he spoke to us about japan and how the transformation of japan came about uh i don't have to tell about dr raj's contributions to this audience so i won't try to do that i also welcome uh sri sainad i think he is one of the best persons to make this lecture he has always been concerned and written extensively and researched extensively about inequalities in this part of the world especially concerned about the uh development uh and other Uh, worries or problems of the rural people so we have sainad as uh, our guest and i would invite i would like to invite him to uh, make the kn raj memorial lecture thank you thank you very much <coughs> i i'm assuming you can hear me clearly yes okay um it's a bit uh, it's a bit complicated and difficult now that i'm trying to speak on this uh, subject of agrarian crisis and inequality at the time when most of the attention is focused on the three farm laws to my mind those laws are an extension an aggravation an intensification of the crisis they are not the crisis in themselves meaning even if we repeal these laws today which we must even but even if we repeal them that is not the end of the agrarian crisis it means one major aggravation has been taken out of the reckoning but it is not the crisis in itself so in the course of the next few minutes i'm going to try defining what i mean by that crisis and placing this in the context of that but i know that people want to hear about uh, about the laws and what's happening currently so i will i will get into that especially since i believe these laws are not just about agriculture they're not just about farming they have an incredible escalation of exclusion clauses that come in many laws here they have gone absolutely berserk but to begin with let me get back to the pandemic and the lockdown in the first week of the lockdown we were all witness to perhaps the largest migrations ever seen certainly in peace time well reverse migrations if you will the largest certainly in peace time perhaps of all time there was some genuine anguish a lot of bleeding heart hand wringing 
media panels, comments, streams of people walking out of the city borders. You know, why are they going back to their villages? We threw up our hands in helplessness, you know. How to talk to these people, they don't, they don't understand. They're just going, leaving. You will find the media, the editorials, the writing is full of this about the, the shock that people were going away. I actually believe that the millions of migrants across the country were acting on a very rational decision. They knew their employers, they know the industries, they know the middle classes, they knew from our society's treatment of them over two decades, how much support and succor they could actually expect from us. Many of them put it in this way. I mean, we, we have interviewed at the People's Archive of Rural India, of which I am editor. We'd interviewed hundreds and hundreds of migrants across the country in little snippets and videos and stories. Many of them put it this way. <clears throat> if we are going to die, better to die surrounded by loved ones. That was their that was their position. Better to die surrounded by loved ones. But our question was wrong in the first place. Asking why are they going back to the villages? The real question, which we have still not asked as a society, individual researchers, activists, intellectuals, economists have asked the question, but as a society, the question was not why are they going back to their villages? The real question was, why did they leave their villages in the first place? And a very important part of the answer could be summed up in two words, an important part of the answer, not the whole answer, but a very important part of the answer could be summed up in two words, agrarian crisis. From, you can see, the aggravation of collapse of livelihoods, the smashing of employment in agriculture from the early 90s when India embraces the brave new world of uh, neoliberalism as well. In, if you look at the 19, between the 1991 census and the 2011 census, a 20 year period, you will find that the category of main cultivator, by which all of us understand the full-time farmer, someone who is cultivating a plot of land for 180 days or more in a year, that population plummeted. Till the 81 census you're seeing, you know, it's the number of people in that capacity, not reducing, in fact, going up the total number of people in agriculture. But between 91 and 2011, the number of main cultivators of full-time farmers fell by 15 million. Between 91 and 2001 census, they fell by 7.2 million. Between 2001 and 2011 census, they fell by 7.7 .7 million. I don't know what the numbers will show in the 21 census, if there is a proper 21 census at all. But I would expect that at least up to the period of the lockdown, there is an intensification of that trend. 15 million people in 20 years, just consider for a moment what it implies. It implies that on average, on average, you were losing 2,000 plus full status farmers or main cultivators every day in those 20 years, every day. That is a huge number. Where did they go? Well, the large majority, I mean, a very large numbers of them, if you look at the primary census abstract, the next column shows you where many of them went. As the column with main cultivators plummets, that of agricultural workers explodes. So we know where a lot of them went. You know, that millions and millions of farmers 
had actually dropped into the ranks of the so-called agrarian underclass. From the, and that process, why was that happening? What was this at the rate at which people were doing? It's also in, from 95, when the National Crime Records Bureau begins to keep farmer data between then and 2015, you know, between then and now, I suppose 2018, you can say, the official figure of the government of India, the National Crime Records Bureau, which I consider a severe underestimate, we can discuss why, comes to over 3 lakh, 30,000, more than 330,000 farmers who took their own lives in distress. Uh, that is, a huge thing is happening in the countryside. But at that time, we didn't ask, why are they coming here? We asked, why are they leaving? Because when they left, it disrupted our creature comforts. It disrupted our comfortable existence. That is what happened with the with these migrants. We never asked, you know, what we never asked what had propelled them to our homes to work as the driver, the cleaner, the, the Mali or or whatever. That brought them there. From the early 90s, we introduced policy after policy package that devastated countless millions of livelihoods in the countryside. And we did it. So let, let me avoid any ambiguity or ambivalence by giving you my understanding of the agrarian crisis in five words. Corporate hijack of Indian agriculture. Okay. And as the significance of what's going on on the borders of Delhi and in many other states now is that for the first time in a very long time, maybe I cannot really, re maybe never in uh, the last 70 years on this scale, the agrarian, the farmers, are confronting corporate power directly. Their every slogan of theirs, every action of theirs, names to three corporations. They know whom they're fighting against. They know what they're fighting for. So you're anyways, and, and that's what I'm saying. It's a recognition of what was visible to many of us, though we didn't want to accept it, that agrarian crisis in five words corporate hijack of Indian agriculture, which has taken place over a period of 20 years. Now, you look at any of the major inputs in agriculture, who controls them? Fertilizer, seed, pesticide, you name them, and you can see corporate control over them. Um, it's not the farmer who controls those. But now this hijack, how was it achieved? What was the process? Sorry. What was the process by which this hijack was achieved? Five words. Predatory commercialization of the countryside. That was it. You let loose in the policy framework. One of the great things we did, one of the things our elite was so proud of in the 1990s was that it unleashed so-called market-based pricing. Many other factors, but I'm saying for our, relevant to our discussion just now, this market-based pricing essentially allowed a gigantic level of price gouging by corporations. Just take seeds alone, okay? Well, six companies or four companies in the world control more than 60% of seed. We all know who controls what in India. Just the cultivation costs exploded. It just exploded. It's always entertaining to me that we keep talking about doubling the income of farmers. By the way, there's just 12 months left to go to fulfill that promise. But when the cultivation costs have gone up four times, three times, five times as much, I don't see A, how you will achieve the doubling of the income and B, even if you did, 
how does it matter and see mr jetley when he was alive and his colleagues when he isn't have always evaded the question of whether this doubling of income is nominal or real anyway the second principle of that in five words predatory commercialization of the countryside uh one example just take seeds the bt cotton seed in 2003 2003 2004 was going in you know uh, the hybrid seeds that were earlier there 450 grams or 1 pound they were selling at 300 rupees per bag by 2003 monsanto's bt cotton under indian so called licenses was selling at between 1600 rupees to 1800 between 1650 rupees to 1800 rupees for a packet of 450 grams now if you use two packets i mean sorry say you 450 grams 1800 means 1 kilogram is about 4000 rupees incidentally the cost of cultivating 1 acre of unirrigated cotton in vidarbha the epicenter of the farm suicides till that point it was 4000 rupees you could do between 2500 to 4000 rupees to cultivate 1 acre of unirrigated cotton and 12000 rupees to cultivate an acre of irrigated cotton 10 years later 2013 unirrigated cotton one acre cultivation cost was already 15000 rupees plus irrigated acre of cotton 40 to 45000 rupees plus so the costs exploded around the time around the time that the cultivators not just his agriculture but the cultivators universe imploded hmm. farmers are not just about cultivation they have children they send to school they have parents to look after maybe one of them in a hospital somewhere they have all the other costs of the rest of us plus this exploding field of input costs so predatory commercialization uh, oh yeah Uh, let me tell you that when it was selling at eighteen hundred rupees a bag, the Andhra Pradesh government that replaced Mr. Naidu's government went to the courts. They threatened to go to the court and under the monopolies, restrictive trade practices, blah blah, price control act. Overnight, overnight, the price of that seed dropped from eighteen hundred to nine hundred rupees. imagine what kind of a markup they had apparently they were making 1400 on each bag in royalties okay so predatory commercialization of the countryside that exploded the cultivation costs of everyone again i'm saying it's not the only factor but to my mind a very major factor third or oh, the predatory commercialization included the complete distortion and smashing of credit available to small farmers okay i mean even consider as late as 2017 18 nabard nabards potential linked credit plan for maharashtra the state worst affected by the agrarian crisis nabards potential linked credit plan for maharashtra sees 53% of all credit of all uh, agriculture credit sorry 53% of all agricultural credit going to the city of mumbai okay now there are no agriculturists in mumbai but there is agri business on a behemoth scale so you know where the money was going as we drove as we drove credit away legitimate legitimately meant for the farmer towards agri business towards other activities that farmer went into debt and you all know that the number of households in debt between 91 and 2001 practically doubled in this country it still continues yeah it still continues so hence the dependence 
on non agricultural loans from banks at gigant at horrible rates of interest and you know the rest of the story the third aspect in five words what is the outcome of that of the hijack of agriculture by corporations the predatory commercialization of the countryside the third aspect of that is the result which is the five words largest displacement in our history that sent those people apart from falling into agricultural labor roles it sent millions of people hurtling towards the cities and you had the greatest migrations you can find the urban rural growth differential in the 2011 census is at its highest in 40 years it's a proxy as you know for migrations also and millions and millions of people are leaving their homes moving out not just to the cities to other villages to other towns to urban to rural rural to rural urban to urban uh, rural to urban in search of jobs that are not there there is no job because it's at the time also that we were absolutely smashing agriculture i mean smashing the public sector smashing millions of jobs without the private sector in any way coming into creating tens of millions of jobs which they'd expect so here is what it ha- what happened covid-19 gave us a brilliant brilliant autopsy a very ugly unpalatable autopsy of the society we are of our inequalities of capitalism itself of neoliberalism in particular and the corpse was on the table it's still on the table it's been on the table before the pandemic as well every nerve every sinew every vein every artery every bone is vividly visible in all its ugliness yeah there's a difference to the pre pandemic period when it was also the case that to some of us the corpse was visible the difference is it covid-19 made it very difficult for us to turn our heads away we were forced to confront we were forced to confront this uh, who we were as a society it held up a very very horrible mirror for us yeah. so all our inequalities stood naked all our you know divisions all our wounds as a society not healing just lying there in front of us on a table that's what covid-19 did and those mass migrations f- held our heads and forced us to look at it but still there are so many who won't look at it and who don't need to look at it there's a reason for that what covid-19 covid-19 did not create our inequalities but it exacerbated them very significantly i'm going to come to the laws them new laws themselves very uh, soon but look at the kind of inequalities india had the big difference from the 90s to our earlier inequalities in fact as you know income inequality actually de- declined between the 50s and the 8 and the early 80s then begins to rise but from the 90s we have the inequalities are different because they are inequality constructed by design N- seldom has you know seldom has inequality been so ruthlessly engineered and so consciously and in some cases quite explicitly in 1991 india did not have a single dollar billionaire not one you can maybe there was someone somewhere tucked away and very modest about it but we have no numbers anywhere to show us that india and indian living in this country was a dollar billionaire by year 2000 there were i think 8 8 or 12 dollar billionaires in the country by that time you have the forbes list you all know forbes i'm not going to explain to you oracle of global capitalism and particularly the voice of billionaires by 2000 you had 12 of our dollar billionaires by 2012 13 
around the time we began the socioeconomic caste census, we had 53. By 2018, India ranked fourth in the world in dollar billionaires and 131 in the human in the United Nations Human Development Index. But these 121 billionaires were and are very special, very special, because their cumulative wealth, as estimated by Forbes, is the equivalent of 22% of your gross domestic product. You know, it's equivalent of 22%. Imagine 121 individuals in a population then of 1.3 billion estimated, their wealth was equivalent to 22% of your gross domestic product. It makes you go for that whole other meaning of gross, right? So this is one thing. Second, within these billionaires, the main person, the number one, Mr. Ambani, Mr. Mukesh Ambani, his wealth was greater than number two and three put together and probably could accommodate a few billions of uh, number four as well, but certainly he was wealthier. But yet another thing about Mr. Ambani is very fascinating. In 2017, the year on which data the 18 figure was based. This single person, I don't believe any other individual did it that year, added $16.9 billion. So that, by the way, not lead to his wealth, but since it was the current year, you can see it as his income in that year. Okay, $16.9 billion. At that time, I calculated it was around 1,5,000 crores. I asked myself, you know, Given the promise of capitalism that hard work will settle, will make and me make me as successful, I decided to look at whether average Indian, who I consider someone working on the rural employment guarantee program, could also make $16.9 billion in a year. I found I was pleasantly surprised to find that yes, you can. It'll take a little time, about 1,87,000 years. Or conversely, 18.7 million laborers can make that amount in one year. This kind of inequality, this kind of gap, I don't need to tell an audience like you what it implies for us socially, economically, and otherwise. I also want to make this point here. I have been saying for 10 years, the agrarian crisis has long ago gone far beyond the agrarian. By, to my mind, by 2010-11, it was a societal crisis affecting every other group in the country in many ways. Three, uh, it, it was not merely, a, it wasn't even restricting itself to a societal crisis. When the largest body of smallholders in the planet are fighting for their survival, against land acquisition is one side, but against the collapse of agricultural, of, of their e economies, against the d destruction of their livelihoods. I wonder if, I mean, I'm not, I don't wonder. I think you might be able to describe that as a civilizational crisis, okay? And there is another dimension to it. It's not just about, it's not just about uh, economics. How much, how much has production gone up or how much has production fallen? How many lives, how many human beings have fallen? A terrible, terrible tragedy. But the suicides are still the outcome of the crisis, not its origin. They are not the crisis. They are its cause. They are, sorry, they are its consequence, not its cause. They are its outcome, not its origin. So the other crisis is not how much has production fallen, just not just how many lives have fallen, however tragic, but also how much our sense of our humanity has fallen, that we were as a society able to accept 330,000 farmer suicides with not much more than a little tongue clicking and 
sadness and anguish and everything else but we accepted it hmm? so i'm saying that the agrarian crisis or what you call this is also a deeply moral crisis it's a, it is a very profoundly moral crisis that's what i have to say about that the coming back to the inequality at the time when mukesh ambani's uh, wealth grew by eight, you know 16.9 billion dollars if you look at what were the wages the figures the numbers we were learning from the socio economic caste census from 2014 that began to emerge 75% of all rural households the main breadwinner took home 5000 rupees or less 90% of rural households main breadwinner took home 10000 rupees or less just 8% of rural indians 179 million households just 8% of rural indians took home 10000 rupees or more and if you disaggregate further and take out dalits and adivasis it's barely 4% who take home 10000 or more most of them government servants working at low levels in collector's office banks clerks clerical jobs the very jobs that we have been targeting and demolishing year after year under our direction of policy now comes the uh, so your inequalities are growing we are celebrating them the credit suisse the multinational swiss company shows us that 76% of all total household wealth is controlled by 10% the top decile of indian society the bottom 5 don't control 5% the bottom 10 the bottom decile the bottom 10% if you like they've gone into negatives from 0.1 plus percent in 2015 in 2019 they were minus 0.9 it's it the, what is this negative concept it well it means that your liabilities are racing far ahead of your uh, assets which is how i understand it anyway the three laws the first thing that i want to talk to you about in the farmers agitation and the three laws is why now the nda was therefore in 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 a majority government for 5 years between 2014 and 19 mr modi came on his own majority of the bjp in 2019 april may a massive majority a solid majority and uh, in the next 10 months these laws were not introduced when the pandemic comes under control as i expect it will in 10 years uh, sorry as i expect it will in a year or two maybe by the end of this year mr modi will still have this government will still have a very substantial majority in parliament for another 2 years why did they decide to ram these laws through at the height of the pandemic that is a question please remember it wasn't just farm laws that were smashed through labor laws 29 laws you know smashed mashed into four codes so to speak all these laws were introduced during the pandemic in fact first they were promulgated as ordinances the uttar pradesh government suspended 39 labor laws including the working journalists act Hmm. and uh, june 5th in the case of the farm three farm laws june 5 these were promulgated as ordinances the farmers organizations from before they were promulgated started telling the government don't do this talk to us talk to us don't do this they were promulgated without any consultation with anybody okay june 5 after that there were local level demonstrations please just because your media do not tell you that there are massive pr- protests out in maharashtra elsewhere and this have been going on since 2018 don't imagine that it's only punjab and haryana i love this it's only punjab and haryana where the problem is so it doesn't matter when last verified by a committee not appointed by the supreme court Punjab and Haryana were also part of the Indian Union. They are both states of this country, not of China, Bangladesh, or Pakistan. What happens there has to concern all of us. But anyway, 
we ignored the fact that it was affecting everybody else and kept talking about Punjab and Haryana. So protests began from June 5. No one was consulted. On September 14, the government brought these three ordinances to parliament to issue them as laws. Nobody was consulted, not the Standing Committee on Agriculture, not the parliament, not the cabinet, not even the cabinet. That is not how this government functions. The cabinet's job is then to go and you know, hold back the ocean of protest. So what happened? September 14th, they were introduced. September 20th, they were ramped through. You suspend eight MPs in the Raj Sabha in the hope of giving yourself the numbers. And even that you are scared that people will vote against it. So you create a voice vote. I don't know how many of you are aware of this. I'm sure, I mean, the kind of audience you are, most of you probably are aware of it. There is no such thing as a voice vote in the constitution of India. There is a division on voting. Voice vote is a convention or a practice introduced by the executive, by government. Yeah, there is no provision of voice vote. In They took this voice vote because they were unsure of their strength. To make doubly sure, they suspended eight MPs. And in the hullabaloo that followed, they also passed the labor laws. So the question of why now, they were being given advice by their think tanks, by the great by very great editors and intellectuals of this country. Mr. Shekhar Gupta said, never waste a good crisis. Mr. Swaminathan Ankla Sarya, Iyer of time said, we need an iron fist in a velvet glove. Mr. Gulati told the government that you are now presented with a 1991 moment. In short, translated into English, all this meant that these farmers and workers are on their knees pulverized by the pandemic, covering under COVID. They want their protest now. That was a fatal miscalculation. So the laws were ramped through. Give me any reason why they were brought between June and September. At the height of the pandemic, when a government's attention ought to have been occupied by far more serious issues, like the loss of life, the breakdown of the health system, etc. That is one. Second, I'm going to show you uh, because I'm sure you've all looked at the laws yourselves, but I'm going to show you clauses of the laws which are very, very affecting all citizens and which are now being brought into cow slaughter laws and other laws. I'm going to show you that. Uh, Mr. Sudhakaran, may I please share the screen? Um, can, I, can you please tell me that you are seeing what I want you to see over here? Uh, is it visible? Yes. yes, sir. Yes. Okay. Then uh, please notice that the clauses, if, see, every, every uh, law has certain exclusions. You know that. Every, but look at the sweeping nature of the exclusions. This is from the contract farming laws, 18 and 19. No suit no prosecution or other legal proceeding shall lie against the central government, the state government, the registration authority, the subdivisional authority, the appellate authority, or any other person for anything which is in good faith done or intended to be done under the provisions of this act thereafter. No civil court, uh, anything which, look at the very important line, any other person, not just government servants, any other person, you can translate that into Ambani, Adani, Birla, whatever you want. For anything which is in good faith done or intended to be done, I am not only really giving you immunity for what you are doing, I am giving, giving, giving you immunity for what you are yet about to do. No civil court shall have jurisdiction to entertain any suit or proceedings in respect of any dispute, blah, blah, subdivisional authority, your collector, your tessel, there, all of them. <laughs> and no injunction shall be granted by any court. This doesn't just apply to farmers. It hits at the citizen's fundamental right of Article 32 of the right to legal recourse. It smashes into that. Then in the APMC uh, Act, no suit, prosecution, or other legal proceedings 
<coughs> shall lie against the government or the state government or any officer of the central government or the state government or any other person in respect of anything any other person in respect of anything which is in good faith done and intended to be done under this act or of any rules made there under now by the way this has been introduced into the karnataka ordinance on cow slaughter with an additional rider please watch this oh yeah no civil court shall have any jurisdiction we've seen that uh, <clears throat> the karnataka prevention of slaughter and preservation of cattle ordinance as you know they got this through the assembly i mean through the um, yeah through the legislative assembly but could not pass it as a law in the council so they have <clears throat> they're going to actually smash that council and issued it as an ordinance look at this clause all those exclusion clauses of central government state government officers are there and one additional clause again i'm saying it may not be unique in history but it has been brought in a particular context that you have to view it watch all persons exercising powers under this ordinance shall be deemed to be public servants that sounds to me like a law written for vigilantes of the vhp and the bjp so i can come into your house organize a lynching search and seizure powers are deadly even at the level of inspector okay all powers exercising all persons exercising powers under this ordinance shall be deemed to be public servants so uh, that i mean that is where we are in terms of the now those clauses you're going to find them introduced everywhere in all laws in fact the uh, ministry of home affairs has announced this week that it wants civil i mean it wants uh, public volunteers to police online content the indian express has an editorial on it this morning <clears throat> so so the bjp it cell whoever else is going to monitor monitor online content and you know the fight that is going on between twitter you're looking at a dismantling of democracy you're looking really at a dismantling of democracy yeah second not only is it these laws that are these clauses that the laws have an impact through you're going to finish your public distribution system if you are going to if you are going to have unregulated trade increasingly encroaching on regulated trade where tomorrow is the government going to do procurement from it's going to be procuring from private corporations not individual small farmers not through mandis but it is going to be procuring at a much higher cost and even more people will be excluded from the ambit of rations than at present you know i mean even your national food security act what it does exclude a significant percentage so you've got these problems already so you're looking at the death of the pds and the ration system you're looking at the dismantling of the rights of the citizen to um, legal redress all these are part of the laws that are going on lastly i mean let me get into these are rich farmers protesting at the gates of delhi i love it the surjit ballas the i mean people writing about this and calling them rich farmers seeking for socialism for the rich which is what that article said the people writing this and attacking these farmers own more in one hour earn more in one hour than these farm households do in a month do you want to look at what the uh, what the figures are please look um punjab uh the total income the total this is the nss the last nss on farming on agricultural income total income 18059 rupees for a household of average size 5.24 that is 3446 rupees per capita okay these are your rich farmers the punjab farmers 3446 rupees per capita monthly average is lower than the lowest paid employee in the organized sector this is something to be understood second uh, haryana haryana household size is 5.94 farm household size 14454 434 rupees that's less than 2500 rupees a month per capita now these two are the best figures in the country 
Kerala is close, but not all that close. Gujarat is a pathetic 7,926 rupees, 5.2% household, which means 1,524 rupees per capita. These are your rich farmers. How many rich people do you know who sleep out in the cold at two degrees Celsius in open metal trolleys, bathe in five, six degrees Celsius in the open cold, and you denounce these people as rich farmers, etc., etc. This demonization has taken place with the full support of the think tanks, the sold out intellectuals of this country. Um, the, I mean, I don't mean all of them. I mean, very powerful and significant sections amongst them. And they had urged the government to push through these, like how they keep telling the, everyone, 1991, the chaos allowed us to create this great situation. You know, uh, in 2011, the Ministry of Consumer Affairs, the Prime Minister of India, Dr. Manmohan Singh, organized a committee, organized a committee, um, consumer group, consumer affairs group, which recommended no transaction in this country between a trader and worker and a farmer should be allowed below the MSP. No transaction. Flat. Those are the words. Hmm. It also asked for fast track courts to settle the disputes and problems of agricultural of cultivators under the Essential Commodities Act and etc. and many other things. It asked for fast track courts. Here is that committee. Hmm. It asks you, enforce MSP. Since intermediaries play a vital role in the functioning of the market and at times they have an advanced contract uh, uh, with farmers, in respect of all essential commodities, we should protect farmers' interests by mandating through statutory provision that no farmer trader transaction can be below MSP wherever prescribed. Now, please, that was a high-powered consumer affairs group and the chairman of which was one Mr. Narendra Modi, chief minister of Gujarat at the time. He was the chair of this committee. You can still find this report on the Ministry of the Consumer Affairs website. Yeah. So the sheer hypocrisy with which all this has happened, I stop sharing now, the sheer hypocrisy with which all this has happened, the sheer mountain of lies, and which I'm so sad that some of the countries intellectuals, academics, pow people of powerful intelligence have lent their, you know, and the media is the, alongside them, the worst performer. You know, the struggle in journalism for many years has been, how do we sell our labor without selling our souls? At present, we are losing that battle very badly. Yeah, because Corporate ownership of media has reduced journalism to a revenue stream. You, you want to survive, you cover what I tell you to cover. So there were actually protests going on in multiple states from September onwards. There was an all India strike where all the major trade unions participated. With all that, you never saw that in your media. In Maharashtra on January 25th, there were 40,000 farmers in, this is the state worst affected by the pandemic. There were 40,000 farmers over there. I'll end with this question. You know, A, can you sustain, can any society forever sustain this kind of inequality? Second, with the point that inequality, that is our large crisis. The agrarian crisis is embedded in our structural inequalities in our inequalities of caste, class, particularly gender and gender and caste as well, um, you know. And please note that a striking feature of the protest this time, never before in my lifetime I have seen in Haryana the tens of thousands of women who are coming into the protest. No Haryanvi friend of mine can recall when they saw women farmers coming to the fore in the protest. This is also happening, but you are not being, it's not being discussed as such, though you may have photographs of it. So one is, can any society sustain the kind of inequalities? Two, the agrarian crisis is part of our larger crisis, as I said, which is now 
not just an economic, socio-economic one, but a profoundly moral one, a civilizational one. And three, ever since January 30th on the Mahatma's anniversary, I have been asking every group that I speak to two, three questions. 103 years ago, a man called Mohandas Karamchand from Gujarat, another Gujarati, but a very different Gujarati. 103 years ago, he went to Champaran, where he saw, he, for him, for Mohandas himself, it was a new exposure. Yeah? He saw a border, a line drawn between the Angrezi Sarkar and the Champaran peasantry. My question to everyone, which side of the border did the Mahatma opt to be on? My question for all of us, if the Mahatma were alive today and in Delhi, which side of the border would he choose to be on? My question for all of us, which side of the border are we on? And which side should, ought we choose to be on? With these questions, I conclude. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Sainad, for that very powerful, eloquent uh, exposition of uh, the agrarian crisis. Uh, in fact, uh, to what I understood from the whole thing, if I may put it in one sentence, is that things are much worse than uh, people like us had even imagined. Uh, eliminating. So I think we have some time for any comments or questions from people who would like to raise them. You can either type in the chat or... Uh, I would... I would appreciate it if the questions were read out to me. Maybe two, three questions at one time, then I'll answer two, three. That's right. Then we can move on to the next. So, As you please. Are there any questions? All well, these are just appreciations, you know, like amazing talk. Thank you very much, sir. Disaster capitalism, Chicago school in practice. But uh, do you have any questions that would be uh, very relevant? Even if any of the <clears throat> organizers presiding over have some questions, I'd be happy to attempt it. Sir, would you, would you like to say something? So there's one uh, question. I mean, it's a very, very broad question. I don't know what is the answer. What is the way you, sir, what is the way forward in this present situation? What okay. is the solution for this inequality? I think it's a very important question, even if it is very broad, and there are serious answers to it. Hmm. Uh, one, you know, one of the things for lack of time, I did not bring into the talk. The Supreme Court has set up a panel, a committee, uh, for which I'm flattered, but uh, I don't know what else to say. My name was one of those suggested by the Chief Justice in open court. I declined. I mean, even before a formal offer was made, but he mentioned it in open court. It got reported in the newspapers, and of course, the media were hounding me for three days after that. I want to tell you what why that idea was so wrong. Firstly, that committee cannot talk to itself, let alone the farmers. Before its first meeting, one fourth of the committee left. One out of four resigned from the committee, Bupender Singh Man, and left that as a three member committee. When long before that, I had said certain things. And we move from there to what is the way forward. I said, you are asking a committee to do in a non-representative committee where I see no farmers. You are asking this committee 
to produce in two months, in two months, a solution. The only thing that I can think of that happens in two months in agriculture is the lifespan of the pollinating insects. You know, they live for a maximum of 50 to 60 days. The bees, the fruit flies, their maximum lifespan is 40 to 60 days. In agriculture, this is the only thing that I can think of that happens in two months. In two months, they were supposed to produce solutions, a way forward, as your questioner asks, when in fact, a much greater, far more eminent panel than anything I could lay claim to in terms of seriousness or expertise. It's, it's way forward. The National Commission for Farmers chaired by Dr. M.S. Swaminathan. Those reports have been lying in parliament for upwards of 15 years. This problem is not just, it is untrue to say this problem is only Mr. Modi and the BJP. That is not correct. Okay. It may be rhetorically a good thing to say because that's what's happening now. The aggravation is happening now. But these policies were the policies of every central government from 1991 with a brief interlude where there was some fall and some little bright spots like the coming of the RTI and the Narega, both of which are under threat. The Swaminathan Commission, if, you know, if any farmer in this country, from Kerala to Kashmir, if any farmer in this country knows two English words, he knows or she knows, Swaminathan report. Please go to Gurdaspur in, or Mukatsar in Punjab. Huh? Go to Nadia in West Bengal. Go to, you know, go to Vayanad in Kerala. They know Swaminathan report. They want it in, in, implemented. That has been the demand of every farmer's protest in the last 10, 15 years. In 2018, 40,000 farmers marched from Nashik to Mumbai. 40,000 of them. And for the first time, and this is what is scaring governments, those 40,000 poor peasants, Adivasis, with no footwear, who came with their feet bleeding, having walked 182 kilometers in 38 to 40 degrees heat, they were joined by a spontaneous mobilization of the middle classes in Mumbai. 40,000 became 50,000 because thousands of students, teachers, farmers, I mean, doctors, engineers, techies, bank employees, unions, bank officers, associations, showed up at the Azad Maidan with food water packets. In 36 years of living in Mumbai, I have not seen that happen. I have seen unions come forward for the farmers. I have not seen the middle classes come forward. It happened again in November, in November 2018 in Delhi, where 2000 students of Delhi University came forward as volunteers. A sympathy has been building for the farmers and it, nece it becomes necessary for the establishment to break that sympathy through Khalistani, Jat versus non-Jat, Haryanvi versus Punjabi. In fact, it's backfiring because what they tried doing to Tikayat has made him more eminent, than, 10 times more important than he was before the agitation. The Swaminathan report needs to be discussed. Not one hour of, not one hour of dedicated time in parliament. The same parliament can call a joint session of parliament at four days, five days notice when it comes to doing the will of the corporate classes for GST. So it holds a joint session. The president comes down at midnight in his special carriage like Cinderella to the party, though we are only left with the pumpkin afterwards. And it's passed with cheers and growing. Please look at the inequality of your parliament, by the way. After we introduced affidavits on wealth, in, uh, on the wealth of the candidates, in, in 2004, number of Lok Sabha MPs who were Karod Patis was 32%. Now it is 88%. Okay. These are the people who are going to represent the poorest. So the, I am saying, the first thing we need to demand is repeal of the laws. First thing. Second, and the more important, larger issue, we need a special session of parliament dedicated, not a three-day token session, please, 
a full session of parliament dedicated to the agrarian crisis and associated issues, related issues. For me, those related issues would include the ridiculous backdoor privatization of water that is happening every day in our country, the <clears throat> rights and entitlements of women farmers, Dalit farmers, Adivasi farmers. If you do not address and engage with the rights of women farmers, you have no chance of solving the agrarian crisis. No chance. See, more than 60% of the labor in agriculture comes from women. And if we are going to add, think, act, act as if their issue is a secondary issue, it will not be solved. So we need that special session of parliament. And we need to introduce a new practice, not only parliament. And I'm appealing to all of you today. Every state assembly should have a session. Every state assembly should have a session to discuss what is the agrarian situation in our state. What can we do? After all, we are all criticizing the laws on the basis that they are a violation of the constitution when agriculture is on the state list. Therefore, the states must take the initiative and hold special sessions of the assembly. We should demand a special session of parliament and then you will have a national conversation on what is. And one practice from other democracies, many of them in the West, let us institute the system of public hearings in parliament. Let the farmers of this country stand on the floor of Central Hall of Parliament and tell the nation what the agrarian crisis means to them. Not mediated by think tanks of Delhi and committees of the Supreme Court. Let them tell the let the farmer address the nation and say, this is what the agrarian crisis is. Let them communicate because the parliament has failed to communicate. The parliament has to hold this meeting under pressure. All our pressure will make that parliament happen. If we do this, what we can do in this is to create the basis for a solution. The Swaminathan Commission gave its first report, December 2004, fifth and final report, October 2006. And then a national draft policy for a draft national policy for farmers. 15 years have passed, not one word of discussion. I think that is the way forward, repealing the laws and having a national conversation on agriculture and policies in agriculture, the old pending issues of land redistribution, land reform, all these have to come. Let's have a national discussion. That's the way forward. Thank you. Uh, there are far too many questions here and uh, I don't know whether we have time for all that. I would ask Professor Sudhagaran, uh, how much time do we have? And of course, I, I can't detain him forever, you know. <laughs> so, I'm okay. Sir, I'm okay. sir uh, yes. we can go up to one, sir. Okay, so I just have to read out some random things. Yeah find are interesting. Can you ask two or three at one time? I'll finish that round like that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. There is a question on, can you do a comparison between what happened in China in the 90s in agriculture and what is happening in India today? Was it similar structural transition or was it very different? And there are questions about farmer suicides. There are some questions regarding whether they were all daily farmers. Uh, there are, I think, more than one person has raised this question. Otto, can you repeat that question? Uh, whether the farmer suicides are all really farmers or not? I mean, more than one person has. Okay. That, but I think. Uh, okay. Probably we have. You would like to answer these two before. Yeah. Yeah. Can I make a com comparison between China of the nineties and? Uh, I am not surely. I'm not sure. I'm competent to. But there is one very big glaring difference. The farmers in India are owners of their land. The small, hold, the small holders in India own their own land. Right? And I think that's a very significant difference. And then you have the landless. And then you have millions of farmers who have land, no patta. You also have hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of farmers who hold patas but don't have possession of the land. Your entire situation is extremely different. In fact, this whole business of uh, land acquisition acts, etc., they became necessary in India because the farmers actually own their land. So, you know, I, I request you to take it forward from there. Now, the important question on farm suicide, I, I love this question. Uh, 
how many millions of farmers are not on those lists you should be asking that is the question you should be asking first these figures are from the national crime records bureau please notice in between in the 20 years that the bureau has done these figures it has gone on its own to give reasons it says seven, at one in one case it says 90% of them had financial problems 93% another case it says 78% of them i don't take the reasons of that of the uh, ncrb please understand what a big embarrassment the ncrb made i am not sure that most of you are aware that the that this government shut down the ncrb in 2017 for 10 months because it, the numbers were proving so embarrassing and the government of india knows that yes these are not really genuine numbers they are very serious underestimates they were causing a serious political problem and let me tell you that political problem was there from 2011 and my friends in the my old friends in the ncrb now in different ministries all transferred out they blame me for it for doing all those stories in the hindu hmm. you know what the numbers were growing so seriously my friend that state governments found it a huge embarrassment the first government to react to this was the maharashtra government it started reclassifying i hope you know that the ncrb is a census almost it's a census of every police station in the country all say in the uh, let us say every police station in the district of tiruvananthapuram submits its annual data to a body called the uh, district crime records bureau not just farm suicides suicide murder rape accidental deaths all this data is presented finally making it out in two reports of um, accidental deaths and suicides in india is the report which has two sections in uh, and crime in india these are two reports suicides come under the adsi all the districts of kerala then submit their data formatted as per order to the state crime records bureau and then the state crime records bureau submitted to the national crime records bureau in 2011 the government of maharashtra took strong objection to this and how idiotic governments and administrators are many of them didn't know that the data they were protesting against i actually tell you i met an ig of police who didn't understand that the from chatisgarh at the time who didn't understand that the data of the ncrb which they were protesting against the numbers was his own data it was from his bloody police stations okay that but they didn't know that maharashtra started creating new categories in the suicides farmer suicides genuine farmer suicides now I, okay now the man is or the woman is just as dead okay the person is just as dead then they created one more category in maharashtra studies farmers close relative suicides in other words saying that all those five people on the household are not farmers hmm? okay so they are not farmers so farmers so i i i then told mr vilasrao deshmukh you know perhaps you should have one more column of farmers close friends suicides you know because when the neighbor dies who is also a farmer you can put it under that number then chatisgarh government under mr raman singh took a unique step immediately followed by mamta banerji of west bengal you know what they did they declared zero suicides in 2011 zero on the ba- mr raman and ms banerji said no farmer can commit suicide while i am chief minister from 2011 more and more states start declaring zero suicides in the 2013 data which comes out in 2014 report 12 states and six union territories declare zero suicides in fact india is the best place in the world to be a farmer 
and you know the best place in the world to be a woman farmer punjab and haryana simply because we don't accept women as farmers we don't count them as farmers they are farmers wives right in our society they are farmers wives or bahu or whatever so we don't accept the rights of women to be farmers so we get these figures down lower and lower in 2013 data 12 states six union territories declared zero suicides and yet the numbers went up and yet the numbers were going up because in the five major states maharashtra unified andhra pradesh uh, karnataka madhya pradesh and chatisgarh the numbers were going up so severely then the government decided this is the time to reformat the methodology by the way please know this the farmers data since 2015 is not comparable with the earlier data set because the methodology has been dramatically altered breaking up categories into farmers agricultural laborers actually agricultural laborers used to come under the self employed and others category but now they are breaking it up into and if you have ever been present you would not ask me the question that you are asking had you ever been present at the recording of a farm suicide hmm. the policeman comes there the head constable constable or sometimes when there is a huge political hue and cry the tehsildar shows up okay how is it the first thing they walk into the house not even a word of condolence to the widowed spouse in maharashtra sat bara dikao in uh, up north pata dikaye now if that's a tenant farmer he is going to be classified as agricultural laborer because there is no patta there is no document 95% of our tenancies are word of mouth they are not recorded tenancies in the sense that you know we try understanding and by the way the new law is the new law on contract you know what it, it it talks about contract farming the need for contracts nowhere does it mandate that the contract has to be written it does not mandate that hmm. anyway so that policeman will say dikao then if 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 it was a woman there is no question they don't want to see the patta it's going to be recorded as woman suicide housewife suicide if it is a farmer and his name is not on the patta though he you know very often the land remains in the name of the head of the household till the very end so the old man is the farmer but the son who is doing all the work commits suicide kills himself under the stress he is not counted as a farmer suicide his name is not on the patta his 78 year old father is considered the farmer in the classic case this happened in the classic case of with uh, in vidarbha where mr prakash katale where dr swaminathan himself visited the house and was you know professor swaminathan was in tears that day looking at what had happened to the agriculture he knew once yeah and that that person had not been given the status of a farmer he was the active farmer in many in this way thousands of women farmers suicides are excluded thousands of dalit and adivasi farmers are excluded because they never have a patta they are on government distributed land sometimes the caste contempt of that surveyor does not accept these people as farmers yeah so your agricultural labor numbers will go up and this is yet another thing now i'm saying that the data are so contaminated you cannot oh let me give you one example and i lend it there 2015 i did an analysis how they were shifting the numbers you know they were shifting the numbers by taking the corpses from one category and putting them in another category now every one of you who is an economist an administrator like my old friend mr vijayanand every one of you knows that in every uh, table of government and in official data there is a column called others now in 2015 report you will find so interesting farmer suicides column drops by more than 
across the more than 50% in the five major states. Yeah. The others column for those expands by 128%. Karnataka's others column expands by 245%. Do, I mean, what do I need to say about this? Anyway, the government got so embarrassed in 2017, it shut down the NCRB and merged it into a body called Bureau of Police Research and Development. The BPRD is a tiny organization which does sample surveys, outsourcing it to private companies, perhaps. It was in short, you're taking it out from a census and making it a sample survey. It's like taking the results of the, it's like trying to merge the results of the national general election into your favorite opinion poll. Yeah, so this is what happened with the farmer's suicides data. The other thing is whether it is 3,30,000 or 4,50,000 or 2,80,000, are we not ashamed that this is happening? Are we not ashamed that one occupational group is showing this many suicides? Unfortunately, in recent times, so many establishment academics are going out of their way Oh, there are, Mr. Saina, there are more women's suicides than farmers' suicides. You're trying to compare a gender and an occupation, and you are showing your misogyny by suggesting that women cannot be farmers and farmers cannot be women. This kind of nonsense goes on every day and is coming from the great think tanks of Delhi. So please understand, the another thing I want to tell you, farmers' suicides, I said, they are not the crisis. They are the tragic face of the crisis. They are, but... They are incredibly the greatest human tragedy I have seen in my lifetime. Thank you. Okay, I'll uh, just read out the last couple of questions. Uh, which are a little different. Uh, one person has asked, what is your uh, thoughts on disguise and employment? I think the implication is that there are far too many people in farming. And uh, related to this, Another question, why are some economists in favor of the farm laws? Many prominent economists are... Sorry, why are so many economists? Prominent economists have supported the farm laws. What is your opinion on that? Okay, okay. one is... The, the other, did, did he say disguised employment or disguised unemployment? Disguised unemployment, of course. Uh, now, this I love this, you know. There are too many people in farming. Let's remove them. Did you create a single job opportunity for that farmer? What options did you give people? And do people have the right, like you have the right, I have the right, I choose to be a journalist, you choose to be an academic. We threw people out by making farming unviable, by destroying its economies of scale, by destroying the livelihoods. We did it in the most cruel, barbaric ways Please let me give you the example of my old home state, Andhra Pradesh. I'm a Telugu from Tamil Nadu, living in Mumbai for the last 37 years. Now, uh, and educated up north, I've had a fair share of different regions because I spend a hell of a lot of my time in the east of India. So in, in Odisha particularly. So let me tell you this, that that Look at the rate at which employment was destroyed in agriculture. Look at the rate at which it was destroyed. 15 million people displaced in 20 years from occupations which they held. One. Two, uh, you know, we all are fond of quoting NSS. 40% of farmers don't, don't, would give up the profession had they a chance. Did you give them that chance? And I'm saying, by the way, 40% is a meaningless figure. If you make it age-wise, if you take it below 35, 80% will tell you that they want to leave farming. Because we've made it a hell. Please understand that if I made academia a hell, a lot of you will drop out of it. We are already doing that, by the way. <laughs> we are already well into making academics a hell from which people are retreating and withdrawing. Right? It's what we did to farmers on a far more brutal way, in a far more brutal scale. Now, this... It wasn't just farmers that collapsed. And I find that there is in the public, uh, there is a very poor understanding of the difference between agriculture and agrarian. The agrarian crisis was about the larger agrarian 
society. It's about much more than the cultivator. There are all those allied occupations, okay? Do you know the first people, first wave of suicides was not farmers in this country. It was weavers because their market, their first market is the farmer and the farm laborer. And from the 90s, everybody switched to Chinese and Thailand t-shirts, synthetics. Okay, we had all kinds of issues and the weavers went into a crisis. Remember, Pochampali weavers, suicides of 1991. That is before the reporting of any large-scale suicides in farmers, which really you start hearing about from the late 90s. Tailors, carpenters. Do you know that I have recorded cases where farmer commits suicide, carpenter dies of starvation. Because we all know the village farmer is dependent, village carpenter is dependent on the farming economy. If nobody orders a new bullock cart, nobody comes for retooling, nobody wants a new plow, what happens to that man who gets 30% of his income in wages and 70% in food? Bangaru Ramachandru, the famous case of Nalagonda, which drew attention to how many deaths there were amongst carpenters from starvation. Okay, Because they were not people given to traditional migrations in that caste group. So all these things, where you know, uh, the farmer you displace in Mandya, in Karnataka, is he going to find a job in Infosys, Bengaluru? Well, actually he will. He'll find it in the canteen. You can be served tea from someone who was a farmer in Mandya who is now serving tea. Earlier he was serving you food, right? He was creating your food. We completely destroyed this. Mr. Chandra Babu Naidu started the trend with Vision 2020, Mr. Vijayanand will remember the famous McKinsey document. And by the way, I want to say this to government of Kerala and elsewhere. Beware, I call McKinsey, McKiss of death. Any government that takes on McKinsey reports and tries implementing them is doomed. Okay, please understand this. You are doomed if you do this. They created this report. First page or first chapter tells you we need to remove 40% of people from agriculture. And they went about it very systematically by destroying agriculture, making livelihoods unviable, and people left. And what happened to Andhra Pradesh? What happened to Andhra Pradesh? And what, ha what did people tell Mr. Naidu what they thought of his... Uh, pro pro not one new job was created of the kind that a, a displaced farmer from, you know, from Guntur can find a job in the organized sector, nothing. They became our domestic servants. That's where your migrants came from. The woman who cleans our house, no, no longer here, she's in Pune, Talegaon. She is a skilled farmer. She still comes at harvest time and gives my wife and me 10 kgs, 5 kgs of brown rice, excellent quality rice. Why was a skilled farmer from Talegaon in the rich areas of Western Maharashtra working as a domestic laborer in Mumbai because we destroyed her viability of her farming. She produces very high quality rice. So this is what actually happened. You want to throw out people, who are you and who am I to say, hey, there are too many people in the uh, academic bodies of Kerala. Let's, you know, have a purge. Let them go and do something constructive. Like, you know, being uh, by, like, like invading Twitter and creating an academic Twitter. No, whose, whose dreams are these? That we have a right to impose something on people like that. We, came, we created no persuasion, no alternative, nothing. And we just went about purging people from their livelihoods and caused ourselves a crisis that is what we have discussed. Now, the prominent economists, uh, you know, there are class divisions in economists also. There is no neutral category of economists. Hmm? There are so many of you. There is Prabhat Patnaik. There is uh, uh, Jayati Ghosh. There is Utsa Patnaik. All of you are also economists of a kind. And I don't hear you celebrating the laws. But the economists celebrating the laws, I have two little sayings for them. You know, that this whole idea of choice, and infinite growth. Hmm. 
you know the idea that apmcs have a monopoly and i will say one word about the apmcs here how to understand them are the apmcs some kind of a paradise that the farmers are fighting to retain no it is farmers who have been demanding reform of the apmcs for 30 years please look at the farm unions and their demands the question is whether the reforms are pro corporate or pro farmer the class issue comes up here are the <coughs> let me tell you my understanding of an apmc horribly inadequate but essential to survival let me put it this way i think all middle class people watching this program will understand if i give you an example hmm? that is government schools who sends their children to government schools maybe only kerala tamil nadu government schools work in most states of the country well, suppose we say it's only punjab and haryana no only kerala tamil nadu a couple of southern states government schools have some quality let's shut down government schools would be meaningless place kerala and tamil nadu are also part of the indian union just as punjab now why do we not argue for shutdown of government schools even many leftists etc all of us we send our children to private schools yet we will not permit closure of government schools for two reasons one bad as they are forget online education in chatis in madhya pradesh you would be happy to see a blackboard in the school hmm? a functioning blackboard yet bad as they are the government school is the one hope of tens of millions of indian children of getting anything approaching an education that is one reason that you and i are never going to ask for the closure of government schools they are going to ask for the improvement of government schools they are going to ask for much higher levels of investment in education second reason government schools are the only bloody place in this country where crores of indian children get one decent meal a day on weekdays do you know that all the little surveys are showing us that when the schools shut down physically during the pandemic malnourishment has shot up in those communities malnourishment has shot up in the communities which were dependent on the midday meal so we are never going to ask for the closure of government schools my friends let me put it to you this way the government school is the apmc of the education sector the phc and the district hospital are the mandis of the health sector the apmc and mandis are the government schools of the agrarian sector okay so this would be now prominent economists cannot see this because they have you know they say choice it's all dependent we have to be, apmc has never had a monopoly in this country they came to break private monopolies even now the bulk of the peasantry sells its products with its produce at the farm gate because of prior word of mouth contracts or indebtedness to the contractor to the taragar to the commission agent to the aratya that as you and i are talking this morning at 1 pm uh, one at 1 pm in the afternoon on february the 10th the peasant of kalahandi is pledging his or her harvest of 2023 to the sahukar why 2023 because 2020 21 22 she or he has already pledged to the sabuka so th that person is we need to see that that person can also get the apmc now prominent economists you know david at who, who based themselves on so called choice you know i this is a larger philosophical issue i'll dismiss in one line the idea that this that this system gives you choice if the 1.2 billion hungry people in the world the un says there are 1.2 billion hungry people in the world if the 1.2 billion hungry people in the world had a choice i would suspect they would choose to eat but the fact that they are unable to do so argues exactly the opposite that they have no choice okay this is the bogus choice of capitalism that's what it is about markets are of two kinds they are physical locations and they are a conceptual construct the other idea of based on growth market fundamentalism my friends is a very religious fundamentalism 
it also has its shankaracharyas and popes it has more televangelists than any other ideology every day on every channel it has the gospel of saint greed the gospel of saint growth the gospel of saint choice and the idea of growth infinite growth endlessly one thing for your economists david attenborough the naturalist said it in one line if you believe in infinite growth on a very finite planet you are either an idiot or an economist i would add or both more often both if you are a, if you are a believer in infinite growth on the planet of very finite resources you are either an idiot or an economist the this also please understand that these economists many of them are affiliated to corporations they are coming out of the think tanks of corporations they are coming out of university departments that have become funded by corporations okay how many of our agricultural universities today please look at the syndicate membership the largest seed dealer in andhra pradesh will be sitting on it the largest pesticide dealer in maharashtra will be there okay so you've had please the same class analysis that you apply to others applies to economists and journalists and media as well thank you uh, i think our time is up uh, i think it has been very very uh, illuminating uh, i think i last doctor i mean professor sudhakaran to call for the official vote of thanks for the session dear saidat dear chair and the participants so we have been hearing for last one and a half hours a very illuminating speech an erudite speech so actually uh, it brought us many uh, issues that for me at least very important that i have not been uh, thought of like that of the women farmers issues the issues of the adivasis and the idea of the engineered inequality that is being created in india and the agrarian crisis and moral crisis so these are very very important ideas that we have we have brought us brought us and also i like your comment on that the eco, regarding the economies that is uh, the issue of choice and and the, on the infinite growth that the economists believe and the critical view on that is also uh, is is to be appreciated and thank you very much for this very illuminating speech thank you very much sir on behalf of the participants and on behalf of costford on behalf of kila and on behalf of ch chairman study and research center we express our sincere gratitude to you sir and <coughs> i extend our thanks to all the participants who were uh, watching this program and i extend to you all our sincere gratitude i express my uh, sincere thanks to our chairman dr v tamguti and once again thank you all thank you thank you thank you goodbye thank you